All right, how is it going guys? So my name is Kieran and I'm here for Eat, Lift, Gain. And this video is basically for anyone who wants to know what creatine is and how safe it is based on actual scientific research. If you've ever had a conversation with a parent or boyfriend slash girlfriend about possibly you taking creatine and they have responded with, that is not steroids, is it? then please show them this video to put their mind at ease. We're basically gonna add a couple of annotated links for anyone on desktop so that they can skip to specific parts in the video if you don't wanna watch the whole thing, or we'll have the time markers in the description below for anyone on mobile. So if you are a human being watching this video, I'm willing to bet that you are either taking creatine supplements yourself or you know someone close to you who is. That is how popular creatine is nowadays. But most people don't really know what exactly it is or how it really works. Just to clear something up really quickly, and this is very important, creatine is not steroids. It is not even remotely close. Taking a creatine supplement compared to taking anabolic steroids is about as similar as taking a vitamin C supplement versus snorting cocaine. I'm really not joking when I say that, so now that we have that out of the way, let's get on with what it actually does. So to properly understand what creatine does, we also need to understand what ATP is and what that does. ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is basically a combination of the amino acid adenosine and three phosphate groups. You should be able to figure out now why it is called adenosine triphosphate. To put it in really simple terms, ATP is basically the body's way of delivering energy in really small packets to the different organs and cells in your body. The way which your body makes ATP is it takes ADP or adenosine diphosphate and it adds a third phosphate group. That final third phosphate group is the all important step and the way which your body delivers the energy to different parts of your body. And we'll explain why in a second, but a really quick note, I'm very sorry how similar ATP and ADP sound. You have to blame the stupid biologists who came up with the names for that one. So the reason why your body can use ATP as kind of like a vehicle for getting energy to different parts of your body is because converting ADP into ATP takes energy, whereas converting ATP back into ADP gives energy out. So ADP is kind of like an empty battery. You can't really do a huge amount with it until you charge it up. And when you charge this battery up, it turns into ATP, which you can then use to listen to your Norwegian death metal on your phone whilst you're in the gym, trying to get yourself pumped up for that one rep max on the bench. But unfortunately, someone has been screaming in your ear for too long and you've used all of your battery up, so the ATP turns back in to ADP. Cool, so our next question should be, where do we get the energy from to turn ADP in to ATP? The main source our body uses is glucose, which is what you would have probably heard a lot of people referring to as blood sugar. This is because it is the main sugar used by our bodies, not for any particular reason, we have just developed to pick this particular sugar to use. So our bodies can break down glucose by a process called glycolysis, and this releases energy which can be used to convert ADP into ATP. This is a perfectly fine process and is the main way our bodies will create ATP. However, the only problem with glycolysis is that it has quite a few steps along its pathway, which means that for a biochemical reaction, it is relatively slow. So our bodies have developed a secondary way of releasing energy in order to create ATP. This is because unfortunately, we can't consciously say to our bodies, Hey body, I'm about to go lift some weights. Can you please create some more ATP for me so I can do more reps? No, what instead we have to do is start lifting weights until our body says, holy crap, we're at the gym, what am I doing? Quickly, let's create some energy. And this is where creatine comes in. So in our bodies, creatine can be converted into phosphocreatine, which is just creatine with a phosphate group attached to it. Now, unlike ATP, phosphocreatine is a fairly stable molecule, which means it is more than happy to hold on to that extra phosphate group for a long amount of time until we start exercising and our body can signal to it to basically release the phosphate group add it on to ADP and create ATP, which can then go into our muscles and release energy in order to contract our muscles and lift all of the weights. This is why creatine is so useful for specific exercises where there are short, intense bursts of energy. It isn't a process that can be kept going for a very long amount of time, but it can produce a lot of energy in a short amount of time. I go through all of this in detail to show that creatine is a totally natural substance that is used in a completely natural bodily process. Anyone who does any kind of exercise, like sprinting, weightlifting, 
javelin throwing, etc., etc., will already be using creatine in order to provide their muscles with this extra energy. So this creatine hasn't just come from nowhere. There is already a lot of creatine in many of the foods which we consume, specifically eggs and red meats. However, some people choose to get extra dietary supplements, usually in the form of creatine powders. And the reason why a lot of people do this is because it has been shown to improve athletic ability. In a 2003 paper by Volek et al, a group of athletes were given creatine supplements and this improved their bench press and squatting abilities compared to a group not taking creatine supplements. The researchers also controlled for any changes in hormone levels or any other factors which might have caused this change and they found that it was just the direct action of the creatine which was causing them to improve their athletic performance. However, a later study showed that this effect isn't going to be found in absolutely everyone. The biggest difference that it made was to people who weren't getting enough dietary creatine as it was, mostly vegetarians. And there was also a genetic factor in how much your body could use that extra creatine. On top of this, they also found that most people take too much creatine when they are taking supplements, around 20 grams a day, whereas anything more than five grams a day isn't going to produce any more of an effect. So creatine sounds like it can really help athletic performance, but then again, so can things like anabolic steroids, and I'm obviously not recommending that you take those. A good question to ask with literally anything which you're gonna be putting in your body is, is this thing safe? And with creatine as opposed to anabolic steroids, we are pretty much certain that yes, creatine is safe for most people to use. Some people were initially worried that taking creatine would put too much strain on your kidneys because this is where your body metabolizes creatine into creatinine, which is basically a secondary product of creatine. Due to this reason, it is still recommended that you increase your water intake whilst you are supplementing creatine. However, most people don't drink enough water as it is, so I think this is just a general good rule of thumb for anyone to follow. Linked to this is another concern that people have based on one of the only side effects of creatine, which is temporary weight gain. Creatine is what is known as an osmotically active substance, which basically means that it affects how much water is taken into your muscles. So when you first start supplementing creatine, you may put on a fair amount of extra weight, up to about three or four kilograms or seven to eight pounds of extra water weight, but this is only based on the extra water being taken into your muscles. This isn't any kind of permanent change. And so the concern based on this was that due to all of the extra water going into your muscles, it may affect the salt concentration inside of your body, which is known to cause cramping. Although there have been anecdotal claims that taking creatine supplements have caused cramping in some people, these, like I said, are only anecdotal. There has not been one scientific study which positively shows that creatine supplements increase cramping. The only possible negative side effect of creatine, which we don't have a definite answer about yet, is to do with balding. Basically, in males who have male patent baldness, which is a genetic predisposition towards balding, if you look at the skin on their scalp where they are losing the hair, there is an increase in levels of DHT or dihydrogen testosterone. DHT is just one of the secondary products you get when you convert the sex hormone testosterone. So we are pretty sure that DHT has a vital role in balding. Where creatine comes into all of this is because one study has claimed to show that in university aged rugby players, when they started taking creatine supplements, their levels of DHT increased. Now this isn't to say that they've shown that you take creatine and you lose hair, but they have shown that when you take creatine, it may increase a hormone which probably has an effect in balding on people who are genetically predisposed towards it. However, this being said, multiple other studies have claimed that this is not an effect which happens. Creatine does not increase DHT, so it is far from a settled issue. This may well reflect the individual reaction people have to creatine supplements based on their diet and their genetics. One interesting side note is that in the United States, a patent has recently been filed which claims to show an invention for preventing hair loss. And one of the main products in this invention is weirdly enough, creatine. So if you are really worried about accelerating male patent baldness and you think that this might happen to you because your dad has suffered from it before, then you may want to think twice about taking creatine. But like I said, the jury really still is out on this issue. But more generally, before you take any supplement at all, it's best to go to your doctor to see if it is safe for you to take and this is still the official advice which we will be giving to anyone. However, I know that most people watching this probably won't do that before they start taking creatine because 
I didn't do that myself. If you have any sort of pre-existing kidney conditions or you've ever suffered from kidney disease, then seriously, no joking around, you should go to your doctor first. But for most other people, based on the existing scientific literature, you should be okay. If you enjoyed this video, please do hit the subscribe button. If you wanna read any of the papers which I've been talking about, then I will link to them all in the description below. But do be warned that if you're not at university at the moment, most of them will be behind a paywall for anything past just the abstract. Let me know if there are any questions or anything which you think I've missed out in the comment section down below. And apart from that, I'll see you all very, very soon. Bye-bye. Eat, lift, game.